welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Welcome to season four of Obsessed Show. You'll note that we are no longer calling it Obsessed with Design. This season, we'll still be chatting with designers from branding, illustration, architecture, and design thinking, but we'll also be talking to other makers and creatives along the way. In fact, when we started the show, the plan all along was to broaden out and talk to other guests eventually, which was part of why our website and Twitter handle and Instagram are all Obsessed Show. If you're into what we're doing here, you might also want to check out my personal branding and marketing tips called 59 Second Friday. That's over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. That's enough about season four. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I have the unique opportunity to interview YouTuber, storyteller, and founder of the No Small Creator Movement, Cody Warner. Cody and I are going to talk about what it's like to get fired from your own company, as he said in his video post, daily vlogging for a year, and why his mission to inspire makers and the doers is so important to him. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Cody Warner. Okay, kids, so all the way from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I've got YouTuber Cody Warner. Cody, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks so much for having me, man. Great to be here. Well, hey, as we talked a little bit um, at the top of the show, or as I told you, I think as we were inviting you to be on here, this show has been uh, historically all about interviewing designers. And so um, over the past few months, I've wanted to expand that out to other creators and other creatives in the industries. And uh, so you are the very first YouTuber to be on the show. So (laughs) that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, man. No, thank you. That's flattering. I'm flattered. I'm flattered. Um... No, and, and I, I totally agree. I think makers of all types, creators of all types um, are just so inspiring to me. Any, anytime you dive a little bit into a creator's story, it just, it, I just get so inspired. So yeah, no, I, pleasure to be here. Thanks again. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, daily vlogging, how that's even possible to do for an entire year. And I want to talk to you about No Small Creator, but maybe before we jump in, um, Nobody wakes up 20 years ago and says, I want to be a YouTuber when I grow up. And nobody even probably 10 years ago says that. So tell us a little bit about kind of what preceded this and how you found yourself in the YouTube world here to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went to I went to college for film. I was a communication major um, with a concentration in film production. And uh, and so. You know, at that time, YouTube was a thing that was in 2005, 2005 to 2008 is when I was in college and YouTube was a thing, but YouTubers weren't really a thing, at least that I knew of. And and I think that, I mean, obviously they were, but I didn't understand that that was a career path at that point. I don't think a lot of people did. Um, so when I was getting my degree, I was thinking, you know, maybe make some narrative like Hollywood style movies, um, some documentary stuff. Like that was my original thought. Then as I started sort of getting further and further into it, I, um, I was, I got much more interested in commercial wedding, um, you know, some of the more easily just pick up a camera and go do it. The um, kind of video projects you could get paid for right now. And <laughs> exactly. Immediately. Money. Like, and even, and even during school, which I did start to do, um, while I was in, while I was in college. So, uh, then I, I got out of school. I got into a field where I wasn't using video at all. And, um, and that was that was painful probably less so because i wasn't using video and more so because i really just chided against um like structure yeah <laughs> <laughs> implementing other people's structures it was a really hard thing for me to do and um i did that for two and a half years and then got into video production so i started doing video production that's when I started getting a little bit more interested in YouTube, but again, never really as a career or as a 
anything like that. Just like, you know, I was trying to keep a, a temperature on, on what was going on in the broader video world. But it wasn't until about two and a half years ago now that I ran into Casey Neistat on the internet and, um, you know, I just came across one of his videos Yeah, and got immediately just hooked and intrigued, not only on him and his personality and his charisma and like just, you know, looking up to him as a role model, um, but also the format, the style and, and, um, the questions, all of the questions that brought up, like, well, how does he make money? Yeah. Um, you know, just, just the curiosity surrounding what vlogging was and, um, got really interested in it. Watched like, I don't know, a hundred of his videos or something. <laughs> and then at that point started thinking I should, this is something that I should do. And, uh, at the time we, I think we were st- uh yeah we had one we had one daughter at that time i think we were like thinking about having our second child and the timing just wasn't right so my wife and i like in conversations about it yeah youtubing you know starting a vlog whatever yeah. although i'm capable it is not the right time you know that was yeah. basically what what my wife was saying to to put it gently like you could do that but just <laughs> don't do it yet <laughs> and uh so waited about a year and at the end of 2017 i was reading this book um a little kind of book of motivational quotes by a guy called grant cardone who's like this super high energy sales trainer motivational type author and uh, in his book he said if there's something you know you need to do stop thinking about it and do it. And, um, immediately vlogging popped into my head and I was like, you know, I've been thinking about this for a year, a year and a half, even I just need to do this. I came home and like I said, it was December end of, end of 2017 and talked it over with Amber, my wife and, and, uh, yeah, dove in on January 1st. I recorded my first one, January 2nd, uploaded my first one and, and, with the commitment of, I will do this for the entire year of, of 2018. So you did that right out of the shoot. You recorded your very first vlog and the next day you did another one and you were every day for the whole year. Yeah. So I tested it out. I tested the style out a couple times, like maybe in October of 2017, I made a little kind Mm. of family vlog where my family extended family and I went to get ice cream and just did a vlog style where it was like at the, you know, really you could call a vlog, a recap of an experience, like a personalized sure. recap of, of an experience. And so I did that. Um, there was also, I think later in October, it was international coffee day or something. So I did three kind of micro vlogs in one day and released them on Facebook throughout the day, getting people excited about three of the coffee shops in my, in my city Harrisburg that I, that I love to go to. And Um, I really liked, really liked both of those kind of test projects. And then on actually the day on New Year's Eve, um, you know, the day of New Year's Eve, I did a, went into the, uh, wine store to get like some champagne for that night because we were having a party and, uh, and like vlogged in public for the first time, like really where it was me and I was talking to a camera in the aisle and uh you know people walked by and it really just did that to test and make sure that i wasn't gonna have a panic attack and not be (laughs) able to talk to a camera in public and so i passed that test and i kind of got in my car and and drove home and got ready for the party and in my head i was just thinking all right like i'm doing this well even when it's not terrifying it's still frequently uncomfortable oh yeah even just different situations where you think you're good and then somebody walks up or walks by and you're like, Oh shoot. I, am yeah. I, am I impeding on their day? Am I, you know, am I being obnoxious or like yeah, all yeah. these things go through your head as you're trying to do that. Or even as you're filming somebody else, you get a little bit of that, but when it's you on both sides of the camera, if you will, I think that's where it gets really intimidating. For sure. Do you have any tips for working through that? Um, 
Yeah, I have I have a lot. <laughs> the, <laughs> some of the top ones are, um, you know, at the end of the day, other people are really responsible for their own feelings and how their days are going to go. Just like you're responsible for your own feelings and how your day is going to go. Right. Like we all have been in that position where we allow somebody to negatively impact our day, our emotions, our um, attitudes, you know, like, and you can feel it. Like I love the control that we all individually have over, over our own emotions and attitudes and, and days. Um, so like, that's my first, that's my first thing is like, at the end of the day, if they're offended or if I negatively impact their day by talking to a camera, by doing something that is now my full-time job, right. Um, that's, that's on them. Right. A, uh, from a slightly different perspective, I am an obnoxious person. I've always been obnoxious. I'm high energy. Like I think I'm, I laugh very loud. I talk very loud. Like you should see me traveling abroad. People give me the weirdest, like I have to be so conscious to just try to talk <laughs> quietly. Um, cause I'm so loud. And, and so, and that's not filming. That's just, that's just me. That's just who I am. So, you know, I'm going to rub people the wrong way, no matter what, I might as well have a blast and make a super dope video while I'm doing it. Well, I mean, it seems legit. It seems like you're having a great time and, um, <clears throat> your, your laugh and your energy in your videos kind of comes through and it is infectious. So like, yeah, <laughs> you find when you're having a bad day, you put on one of Cody's videos and like you do one of your laughs and I'm just like, oh, I just can't help but crack a smile at that point. Yeah. 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 That like you are so. Um, just like tickled by something in the moment. It's usually something you're doing, like right. usually like right. laughing. At like I'm making my own self laugh. Right. Like, it's so so ridiculous. <laughs> but I think that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I think most people, or maybe few people, have ever seen behind the scenes of a of a YouTuber's day. So, you know, we can only imagine what everybody's up to because we see the vlog side of it what's the rest of it look like? What, what's an average? And maybe there is no real average, but what might a typical day or workflow look like for you? Yeah. Um, it's really, it's really shifted throughout kind of my vlogging career. So in the beginning it was, you know, very unscripted, very un, unthought about, like I would jot down notes and ideas throughout the day for the next day's vlog. But I, you know, would never script anything or really plan much because mm -hmm. that's one of the beauties of daily vlogging is like you just use the content of your own day to create content for the internet. It doesn't have to be super, in in my opinion anyway, it doesn't have to be super uh, scripted or good even. It just has to happen, right? Um, as I've transitioned to, you know, now I don't do daily videos, now I do I do like weekly or bi-weekly videos. Um, it, there is a lot more planning that goes into it. And there's also a lot more, you know, I have a manager now, so there's, you know, daily conversations with him um, about brand integrations and, and checking in on projects and, and that sort of thing. So it's, there's real, I don't have a typical day, which is what I, which is what I absolutely love about this sort of job, quote unquote, is, um, you know, you take those like surveys, senior year, junior year, when you're in high school about what should you, what should you be? And I, the one that I always got was um, an ambulance driver. <laughs> 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 I should drive ambulances because, um, and it always came back to the question of, you know, do you like routine or do you like adventure? I, for, I forget how yeah. they worded it, but it's just when I have to do the same thing day in and day out, it really, I really get demotivated. And, um, so for me, you know, there's, there are some days where I spend hours in email or hours on the phone or, or text messages with different brands and ma and my manager and all of a different thing. And then there's other days when I don't do that at all. And, and there's now days when I spend, I'd say an hour or two, like kind of really, locking down a video and the shot list shot listing the video and and kind of pre producing a video mm -hmm. um 
and then there's other videos and days where I'm just on the, on camera out vlogging, recording stuff, having fun with friends. I just recently did one with uh, Becky and Chris up in Buffalo. And that was just like, you know, I had a, I had an idea of what I want. I wanted to compare two cameras, but really I just wanted to have fun with them, you know? So it's, it's very sporadic and, and that's by design, you know, that's how I, that's how I want it to be. Um, you had asked about admin travel. So my wife, Amber has knows that I just am horrible at scheduling. I'm horrible mm -hmm. at, it's just not my forte. It's not something that I yeah. like doing. So she's really stepped up and has, has assumed a bit of an administrative role in my life, um, scheduling flights and train tickets, hotel stays and stuff like that. And then also, um, just managing my email, making sure that I'm on top of all of the different emails that are coming in and, and at the very least just saying like, Hey, did you see that one from whoever, yeah. you know, at dinner time or something like that? Yeah. I, I kind of figured something like that was going on when I got the schedule or the calendar invite from, from right. Amber. <laughs> I was like, right. Oh, cool. That's, that's cool that she's helping out. Maybe mm -hmm. shift gears a little bit. Um, tell us about what no small creator is. Yeah. It's an idea at the, at the forefront, at the, you know, top level, it's an idea of, of on YouTube. And if you're not from, you know, in the YouTube bubble, this won't make sense, but on YouTube, um, it's a common term to hear small creator. So, and, and what they mean by that is just people who don't have a, a large following. Um, but they're still making content on YouTube. That's like, both the people who have smaller channels have embraced the term small creator and the, the people who have bigger channels have embraced it to talk about the people, not in a, not in a mean way or derogatory or any, it's just like, it's a classification. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and YouTube itself, like if you watch the content that YouTube puts out about uh, the algorithm and creator studio and all of the different things, like they'll refer to channels with, not as many subscribers as, as small creators. The small creators yeah. are thinking this, the small creators that. And so I started to adopt that lingo as I got more and more into the YouTube world and just hated it. Every time I would say it, I would just hate it. And it was like, you know how you feel something inside and you can't really put words to it, but like you're feeling it. And, and anytime I would say small creator in a video, um, I would have that feeling. So I, I eventually ended up putting words to it and, and it came out in a video and, um, just as the, the idea that there's no such thing as a small creator because creation is massive. You took something inside of your head, you had a vision an idea, and then you put it out into the world and now it's a tangible thing. Even if it's online, it exists, you know, and there's nothing small about that. There's, there's no small creation and there's no small creator. And, um, made that into a hashtag, ask people to start using it. And it was, it, it turned into a movement where people really got behind the idea and, and loved the idea of the, the biggest issue that I have is that it, it can kind of turn into a limiting belief, like without unconsciously, it can unconsciously turn into a limiting belief for those people who are calling themselves small creators. Yeah. And it, and it, in essence is giving them an excuse to not perform at a higher level. I think in my mind, it's like, well, I'm a small creator again, unconsciously, nobody would ever consciously say this, but I'm a small creator. So I don't, I don't have the right to go out and, and get that content or I don't have the right to be obnoxious in public to create something that I think is going to positively affect the world on the internet. Yeah. You know, I, I need to be quiet because I'm a small creator. Just like some of those limiting beliefs. That's what I, that's what I really chided against. And so, yeah, it became a movement. It's a Facebook group. There's about 4,000 people in the Facebook group now where, um, it's about encouragement and, and really just about trying to instill in each other that you should be making stuff regardless of how big your following is um, because it's you're impacting the world and because it's, it's healthy and, and helpful for us as humans, I think to make stuff. Well, I think you've had a pretty great um, increase in followers here in the first 18 months or whatever it's been. 
Yeah. How, how much um, time did you see that went by before you saw kind of the internet respond to the content you were putting out? Yeah. Um, so the first video that I had that, that really popped, that was at day, I created the video on, I think, day 114. Um, and then it didn't really like pick a get caught up in the algorithm on YouTube until I think like, um, I don't know, a month or so after that, like 30 days later. Um, and, and the internet started to respond, you know, that's a good way of, of putting it to, yeah. on, on that one. And I, so I went from, I started with 111 subscribers. Um, and then, you know, I, I would say I was around like 600 or so subscribers for, a while it was it was slowly increasing that entire time but when that video hit i jumped up to 2700 subscribers but again kind of going back to the idea like the mentality of of no small creator some of the interactions that i had with individual subscribers when my total number of subscribers was down at the below 1000 mark those were some of the biggest those were some of the biggest interactions you know like mm there's, it's one thing to have kind of quote unquote, the internet respond. It's another thing to have a human being on the other side of the world respond and say, right. I'm starting a business as a result of, and, you know, and, and you encouraged me through your content to start this jewelry business. I'll never forget the first time I got a comment like that, where she was like, I, I'm, you know, I make jewelry. I'm going to start selling it today. And you encouraged me to do that. And, and I just thought, Oh my goodness, like I've made it. That's that's all I ever wanted was right. just to encourage people to get out there and take action and do stuff. And uh, yeah, so so I was getting a response, you know, um I would say like by day by day 60 or 70, but I wasn't seeing those like tangible numbers, that tangible channel and number growth until around um yeah, like day 160. And then I think on day 192, I um, did a collab with with a guy named Peter McKinnon, who just had a massive channel at the time is like yeah. 2.2 million or something at the time. Yeah. Now he's at I like 3.6 million you. subscribers. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, my channel just really popped after that. I, I think I gained like uh I gained like 20,000 subscribers in the first 48 <laughs> hours after that, after that collab. He's got a few followers who might be paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's how I had found you. So I had um, started dipping a toe in the YouTube world probably in February of last year. Yeah. And kind of rolled out a couple of um, podcasts into videos and then started experimenting with some other stuff. And of course I was kind of hungry for, all this how to like how how do you use this camera and how what, what are the right settings and what should i right. upload and i think that's how i found peter because he had so many great videos about the how to stuff and then right found you shortly after so that was pretty cool so i love it so are you still doing any like consulting or other projects besides just putting out content on youtube Yep. Some of my like, um, core income is based off of consulting. So I consult with other YouTube channels. I also consult with businesses that are interested in incorporating kind of YouTube style vlog style content into their marketing strategies. Yeah. Um, so I do that. I also do some tutorial stuff on Patreon, but yeah, I, I, I love talking with people. I talk with about 20 people every month, um, who are trying to build YouTube channels one-on-one. -on -one. How do you balance all that between the pushing out your own content and finding time to consult? And so it was a lot harder when I was daily. So I started consulting when I was a daily vlogger and like on the days when I had like, you know, four or five consultations, it was so draining to like try to do all those consults, pour yourself out into those people and then still figure out what to make that day and, and how, yeah. to how to make something that day, like just being exhausted and kind of like feeling like you had nothing left in the tank. Now it's a lot easier. We just kind of schedule it where, you know, I'll have consulting days and then on those days, generally I d I'm not required to make anything. You know, I don't have to work on a video. Um, and yeah, so it's the schedule is just, I, I like to kind of split it up where I'm consulting. I can focus totally on that and then, 
other days I can focus totally on creating a video or, or scripting or admin or any of that other stuff. Is there a production team behind your YouTube work at this point or are you doing all the things? I do all the things. <laughs> I, I do all the things. Yeah, I, um, I think that a production team sounds you know, that sounds great, but in the actual, you know, coming from the commercial world and, and owning a company, um, when you hire employees, it is great. You can do more work, but there's a lot of kind of training and communication necessary in the, like, there's a lot that goes on in here that you don't understand is not understood by everybody out here. And, yeah. and so to have to, communicate that like when i see these channels where i know there's somebody else editing there's somebody else shooting and then there's the talent you know or whoever's yeah. like on screen i just think like man that is that is an intense process to be able to still create great content so yeah it's all in here especially to try to do that a couple times a week yeah totally um you know when um I mentioned this a little bit before but i think you've been such a force of positivity on the internet in a world, especially YouTube, there's some, some weird and, and dark edges <laughs> Yeah, there. What, what inspires you? What gets you motivated? And you know, where's that, where's that energy coming from? Yeah, for me, it's, for me, it's purpose. You know, I, I, I love people and I love, I, I really love when people positively influence me. And so I just want to reciprocate that like back out into the world. Um, the, when I, when I say it comes from purpose, like I feel a very strong core desire to help connect and build bridges between people and people with differences. And just like, I am very, very motivated by how negative interactions can get on the internet. You know, I'm yeah. very motivated by like trying to be a, a force on a force opposing that a force opposing all of the kind of dark edges of the, of the internet. And, and that's very motivating to me. Um, yeah, for me, I think what's behind the smile and, and the positivity is just, I really want that. I truly believe that having a positive mindset just makes your life better. And so that's true for me. And I think that that's true for, for everybody. And I want to help connect everybody like under that sort of driving force. Well, I mean, just coming from me, at least, thank you. It's, I think it's <laughs> helpful. It's uh, it's a, it's a little spark in the day when I see one of your videos come across. Thank you, man. Um, so we know it can't all be rosy all the time. So when you hit rough spots, what does that look like for you? And how do you kind of get yourself re-motivated or kind of back out of that? Yeah. Um, I think, so I just, there's this guy that I love. I got to speak alongside him or like, uh, he was the keynote speaker at a conference that I spoke at last year. His name's Inky Johnson. And he's a, he was a football player but he got like severely injured and he never made it to the NFL because like his arm, when you see a picture of him now, like his one arm is like jacked and like, you know, like a, mm -hmm. you'd think a football player's arm would be. And his other arm is just super thin and he has to wear this like white complex compression sleeve on it. Mm -hmm. And like, so he's got this very, this, his look, you know, you, you remember him when you see him and, um, he talks, he just released this talk on IGTV yesterday, I think, um, about perspective and, and about, you know, when something annoying happens, when something hinders you or holds you up, you have to realize that if that had not happened, something extremely horrible may have been waiting for you right around the corner. But because this annoying traffic jam or like hindrance stopped you or directed you a different way. Now you're still alive. You're still breathing. You're still here. You're still creating. And, um, that's a perspective that I try to bring into any, any hardship of like, okay, this sucks and I don't like this and this doesn't feel good. And I feel like, you know, punching something, but, um, I, I have to remember that who knows what would have happened had that thing gone through. So that goes right. into, 
you know, any, any brand deal that falls through anytime, like, um, you know, someone doesn't like a video that I make, a, you know, someone, someone who like has the ability to kind of veto the video being released oh, yeah. anytime, you know, I just think, I just think, okay, well, who knows what was going to be the result of that, of that video. And, and so that's one perspective. The other, the other perspective is just without obstacles, without hurdles, like the more obstacles and hurdles somebody has in their life, the, the better they are. It just time and time again, it gets proven that, that, that those things build character and they build, um, they build empathy, they build connectivity. And those are all things that I just value so highly. So anytime something hard's going down, first, I, I always try to feel it. I always try to really embrace the negative emotions, the, the pain, really like, really just give myself completely to that first, because I don't ever want to gloss over or like pretend that pain doesn't exist because it's so prevalent in our world. I want to feel it. But then I, I try to pull myself out of that and, and think about, okay, but this is just one more stepping stone in kind of the, in kind of the, the, the creation of my character and who I am and my ability to connect with other people in the world. Um, so that, that for me, that perspective is what, is what gets me through rough spots and hard times is, is that character building. So maybe this is kind of like choosing a favorite child, but, um, do you have a favorite vlog or video that you've produced? Um, yeah, uh, it is, it is hard. Um, just because like, no one video that I've done is really that good. <laughs> you know, like they're better kind of as like a, uh, you know, as a, as a set, right? Because. Do you look back and cringe on the early ones? Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah I mean, no, even like, things I made like, like two months ago, I look back and go, ah, oh, I still had that yeah. wrong. Like, what am I doing? Same, man. Yeah. I look at something I made a week ago and I'm like, mm, you know, I, I messed that up. And that's part of it. You know, that's part of the improvement yeah. of it. And, and that's good. But one of my favorite videos that I've ever made, um, I think it's still called this. I don't think I retitled it, but it's like copying Casey, plagiarizing Peter and finding you. And yeah. in the video, I like fly up. I do this like animation where I fly up and I kind of grab this idea out of thin air. And what I used to represent the idea was this like big inflatable unicorn. And um, <laughs> just shooting that whole sequence was really fun. And then animating it was really fun. And um, the idea behind the video is just, you know, imitation is part of the learning process, but it's also not enough to, if I can tell that, a, that, a, that someone I'm watching is imitating somebody else, that isn't a turnoff for me. That's mm -hmm. part of, I know that that's part of them finding their own voice and their personality, hopefully they're allowing it to still shine through enough to make it its own unique piece of work and its own unique and different thing. And um, I really love that message in that, in the video I say, don't get so caught up trying to be original that you forget to be yourself. And I just, I so strongly agree with that, that there's this massive kind of push on, on YouTube. And I think, I think everywhere um, where it's like, be unique, be original, be you. And it's like, uh, yeah, that's great. I totally agree. I do want everybody to be themselves, but don't get so caught up trying to be different than everybody else that you forget to just actually embrace who you are. And fact of the matter is, the reason people get followings is because we all have so much in common. We all have so many similar interests that, um, of course, we're, we're going to be doing things the same when we're representing ourselves through art and, and, and work and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's one of my favorites. So maybe when it comes to um, finding you, we teased this a little bit at the top of the show. Um, you had a video about, you know, getting fired from your own company. Because yeah. you were, you had a production company that you were, you started and were running at the same time that you were doing YouTube. So yep. kind of tell us that story and how that came to <laughs> where it is today. Yeah. Yeah. So my partners and I, um, 
had a, we had started a company in, in 2012 and uh, we were doing this commercial work and, and wedding videos and near the end it was almost completely commercial. We had hired some people so I was focused mostly on sales in 2018 which is with the year I started vlogging and I you know because I was so immersed in the world on YouTube I started getting really intrigued about the applications of vlog style video for business and yeah. so I started really like even trying to steer my company in, and I say my company, I only own half of it, you know, so mm -hmm. it wasn't my, it wasn't my company. That is how we talk, right? But um, trying to steer it in the direction of like, let's do what I call level up video, which is like just one level above cell phone video. So it yeah. looks better than all the cell phone video, but in no way is it being compared with like a Ford truck commercial, right? Sure. Like, so you're, we're trying to compete on the cell phone video level, not on the Ford truck commercial level where they've got million dollar budgets and, you know, we don't make that much money and we can't really compete on that level, but we can crush on the level of making better videos than all these other um, cell phone videos. Yep. And so I started trying to steer us in that direction. My partners just weren't like, they're like, we get it. We understand. Like you did a good job selling it to us, mm -hmm. but we want to keep on making higher, you know, highly produced commercial content yeah. for, for businesses. And so I was like, yeah, no, that makes sense too. Like I just understand that's where their passions lie, you know? And, um, and so at that time we had, we had talked about like, you know, just brought up the conversation of a buyout and then, and then, um, Fast forward three months, you know, we tabled it because it fin financially it just didn't make sense at the time and, and whatever, tabled the conversation. Um, three months later, my channel had blown up. I was like flying places. I was spending weeks in California. I was in Belfast, Northern Ireland speaking at a conference and I was actually standing on a rooftop and um, with like Matty Apoya, Peter McKinnon, Sorella Moore, and Jesse Driftwood. Like we're just on this rooftop, <laughs> like getting some laughs. It is like, yeah, it's like when you when it to say it out loud, it sounds <laughs> like some sort of whatever. But um, and I got a Slack message from my partners and they're like, hey, let's meet up when you get back. And I just knew, like I just knew yeah. they were going to bring up the they're going to reopen the conversation about a, about a buyout, about um, asking me to leave. And, and so I titled that video, you know, I got fired from my own company when we had that meeting. In reality, it was a meeting where, you know, three partners came together and decided the best direction forward for not only the individuals, but for the entities and, and companies involved. Right. It's yeah, like, yeah. it was very, it was very normal, but um, in my mind, the reason why I didn't feel guilty about titling it, I got fired from my own company is because I knew that for, for kind of the masses, for the mass audience, that would be the most comparable kind of terminology to, to relate to the experience that I, yeah. that I had just had. And I, so I explained it in the video for the most part, I don't think really any, but I think everybody was kind of so shocked by, by it that because I had never, I had never brought up on the vlog that my partners and I talked about a buyout three months previous or, or mm. anything. Um, though, you know, you as a business owner, business owners know like that it's always on the table. When right. you're, whenever you're in a partnership there, it's always there. That's always a conversation that is sort of below the surface is like, should we stay together? Should we split up? Like what's best for the company? So, um, yeah, then it took about two months to just get it all figured out legally. And then uh, in on November 1st, the video I made that was called like how it feels to get bought out of, of your own company or something like that. And, uh, and yeah, just super numerous moments in that day, you know, where I felt like I was kind of outside of myself looking in um, just because that was the first company that I had started that I had been, you know, I had been there since its infancy. I'd, I'd helped build it up to what it had become and I was leaving it. And it was a yeah. really interesting feeling. Well, um, a lot of our listeners will know that I, I went through something sort of parallel to that very similar yeah. experience of, um, with the, with the chief difference as I was the one who started the conversation and said, Hey, 
you know, this, maybe I want to do something else. And, you know, yeah. it was six months of kind of figuring it out, but, but once we figured it out, the split happened quickly. And that, that's what felt so jarring for me looking back was like January 2nd of 2018, I went in to say goodbye and January 3rd, I was at home. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's, that's a really jarring experience when you go from doing the same thing for 16 years and then you're on to the next thing. So yeah, um, totally. I, but it, that story definitely resonated with me and definitely, um, was, was interesting all the parallels. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about being on that rooftop with Jesse and Maddie and Peter and all those guys, you've done a lot of collaborative projects here in the past. I'm curious who some of your favorite collabs have been. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, there's is actually they both have channels, um, but two of my friends, Jack Stoles and Burke Collinane, um, came down one time from like Massachusetts and Maine, respectively, but reverse, reverse, respectively, and uh, and yeah, just like we were skating around, biking around, just having fun, having a blast. I really look back on that one really really positively. My friends, Method Box, Nathan and Jonathan, they're two brothers out in LA. They took me up in a helicopter, which is my first helicopter ride. And we took the, they, we, we asked, <laughs> I think like they had the doors on and, and then somehow it came up that maybe the doors could be off. And we're like, could we take the doors off? And they're like, of course. So doors off helicopter ride. And I love that content that we created. Um, Swoop, uh, out in LA, also Swoop that was like the day after i guess uh the club with with method box but she's just fantastic and we got to talk about some of the issues around how to cross um you know go across male female when it comes to creation and mm -hmm. and um and just talking about women who are creators and and how that all plays out so yeah, so those are some of my favorites. Obviously the ones like, you know, going up to Toronto to do a, make a video with, with Pete McKinnon was, it was an incredible experience. And we got to, we actually took that unicorn. So that unicorn that I talked about <laughs> earlier, that floaty unicorn, we took it out behind this boat and, and uh, you know, I was like holding on to this rope, <laughs> like a tow rope, not, not like a legit one with a handle, just like a rope. <laughs> and uh, trying to hold on to this unicorn, which was not designed for towing. And, um, and, and I, that was really poetic to me, um, you know, that I had got that unicorn in the kind of the beginning and, and use the unicorn as, as a, as a, a symbol for an yeah. idea. And then I'm, I'm out here with Pete getting towed behind this, behind this uh, boat on, on that idea. Right. And uh, so, yeah, th those are all, those are all fantastic experiences for me. So something I ask all of our guests, um, designers, especially are very obsessive lot. <laughs> and yeah. I think creatives, sort of get hooked on different things. So I'm, I'm just curious what it is you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Yeah. The thing I'm most obsessed with right now, I am, I just feel so responsible, like so strongly, I feel so strongly about, I need to encourage people to take action mm -hmm. um i need to figure out ways to make compelling clickable um viral videos that affect and reach millions of people with a with the message of don't sit and on your laurels like get out there and take action i need to figure out how to do that i'm obsessed with figuring out how to use YouTube as a tool to affect people with that, with that message. Um, that's one of the, it's one of the biggest ones, like at a much, at almost the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm obsessed with figuring out, um, this new lens that I just bought, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, I, I just, I get very obsessive about, about lenses and gear and stuff, which is so funny. And I have to constantly remind myself that it's not the gear that makes the good content. It's the, 
it's the content itself, you know, and um, what else am I obsessed with? I guess those two, you know, I, I get, but I, I hear you, man. Like, I think that idea of it's so easy to just become obsessed with things in Mm -hmm. this, in this kind of creative field. And I don't think that that actually Grant Cardone, who I mentioned earlier, he has a book called be obsessed or be average. Um, And that book is in essence just about don't, there's a lot of kind of negative talk about obsession, but obsession can be a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about dream projects? I mean, you've gotten to do some pretty cool stuff here in the past uh, yeah. year and a half. Um, but but what's on your radar? What are you what are you really kind of reaching for as a next step? It's a good question. Um, dream projects. So I I would love to make kind of a, a mini or or micro documentary about um, forced prostitution and and. Mm-hmm kind of like it as an issue, but also steps forward from the issue and how to kind of combat it. I want to, that's, that's a goal that I have. I also really want to create a tangible community around, around creation, around kind of like almost like a film school for, for YouTubers that is, that is, um, you know, in person. That's something Mm -hmm. that I would really, that I'd really love to do a project that I have been dreaming about for a while, but haven't really like pulled the trigger on trying to execute um, and create the partnerships to execute. Those two things are are really exciting for me. I just found out that NASA wants to like colonize the moon by 2024. And I was like, what if I made a video on the moon? That'd be super dope. First (laughs) vlog on the moon. I don't know if that one's, if that one's attainable or not, but I get, I get a million ideas every day. And, uh, yeah, some of those are some of the ones that, that kind of stay at the surf, stay at the top of my mind. So what about a favorite piece of advice, either one of your favorites that you've received or one of your favorites to pass along to other creators? Yeah. The, the, some of the best advice I've ever gotten is have, have thick skin. Just don't allow yourself to be offended by, by stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but tempering that with, not becoming shut off, not becoming a wall to the world and just going inside yourself, still remaining empathetic, still remaining um, just someone who can feel, but also someone who can smile and laugh at all of the bad negative things that, that arrows that get pointed at them. Um, And, and, the really the biggest part of that and when that advice came to me was like the idea that for the most part things that offend us weren't actually direct weren't actually arrows that were directed at us they're just things that we're letting get to us and like so both in those cases and when it really is intentional try to try to develop the skin required to just keep moving forward even though sometimes life can be mean yeah That's really good advice. Well, Cody, it's been awesome chatting with you today. Before we let you go, um, tell all of our listeners where they can connect with you, find your videos or anything else you want to lead us towards. Yeah. On YouTube, um, my channel is called Cody Wanner, C-O-D-Y-W-A-N-N-E-R. And that's also my handle on Twitter and Instagram, which are Twitter's. I love hanging out on Twitter Instagram. I'm really into Instagram stories. I don't really understand how to use the grid, but the stories, I'm there for the (laughs) stories. And um, yeah, those three places. Well, that's awesome. Cody, you're an inspiration. Thank you for uh, being a a little bright spot on the internet, especially on YouTube. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that is show number 121 officially in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And I just happened to realize as I was getting through the editing process here, somehow Cody and I went this entire show without talking about his new daily podcast. It's called The Call with Willie and Cody. And it's a daily podcast to get you energized to go do something. So check that out. The podcast 
is The Call with Willie and Cody. As we expand our topics here at Obsessed Show, please tweet at Obsessed Show and let me know who else you think we should talk to. Do you want to hear from video people, from authors, from painters? What kind of creators and creatives and makers are most interesting to you? Because that's who I want to interview on this show. Don't forget to check out that new 59 Second Friday series all about personal branding and marketing on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Josh Miles. And it would mean a lot to me if you just hit that subscribe button. Every subscriber means a lot. You can get all of today's show notes on our website, still at obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show recorded its first episode at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Visit milesherndon.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.